um, fix buffer bloat in the uh, in the Wi-Fi stack. So first, I would like to get a show of hands. How many know what buffer bloat is? Pretty good. How many use Wi-Fi? And how many are too busy using the Wi-Fi to listen to what I'm saying? <laughs> right. So um, there should be something for almost everyone then. So um, I'll go through a little bit about what it is we've been trying to fix and some of the peculiarities and uh, properties of the 802.11 MAC protocol that gives some constraints on how we can fix this. And then I'll show uh, what we did and give you a few slides with some, uh, some performance results. And then the uh, most important thing is this uh, next step thing where uh, I'm hoping it will be a little bit uh, of an interactive session, or otherwise we will have a lot of awkward silences. So I'm, trying, I'm hoping to get some, some feedback on some of the ideas uh, we have for the next steps, whether or not they are a good idea, whether or not it's completely daft what I'm proposing, and maybe some ideas of how to do it as well. So, uh, first up, the problem, um, buffer bloat. So this has been, um, this has been pretty much fixed in large parts of the stack, but as we can see here, um, for the th this is sort of a plot of different uh, queuing disciplines applied to a Wi-Fi link, and even the best ones still have almost 100 milliseconds of latency at the Wi-Fi link. And uh, I'll get back to why that is and, and what we did to fix it, but this was sort of what we had going into this. And then the other thing that we did was look at this thing called airtime fairness. So um, in the MAC 11 protocol, by default, it will provide sort of what throughput fairness, where the time spent transmitting to each device um, depends on the time, this is this one, that this is the default, uh, the, the bottom one there, that um, it depends on how long each station actually spends transmitting, where what we want is really this thing, uh, complete fairness, because the, um, the scarce resource here is the time spent transmitting on the air. Um, because when we get the other thing, we end up with, uh, with throughput fairness, which means that the whole network goes at the rate of the slowest station on the network. So if you have one device that's at the other end of the room, has a bad connectivity, that's going to slow down your whole network because it's taking up all the airtime trying to get a few packets through at 11 megabits per second. Um, in order to fix this, uh, we had some constraints from the MAC 11 protocol. We must uh, do aggregation, so because there's a lot of overhead each time we transmit anything on uh, Wi-Fi, we aggregate packets to try to be more efficient. And that has to be done per traffic ID, which is an, an identifier that each packet is mapped to, usually by, by diff serve mapping. So this is also how Wi-Fi does QoS. Uh, and we must also handle re-injection of packets for retransmission, which means that if the driver sends out packets to the hardware um, and the hardware fails to transmit it, uh, like doesn't get an act back, it will s throw them back up to the driver, and the driver will then re queue them for the next transmission. We must also, of course, be able to keep the hardware busy, especially on um, low power devices. This means that, that there's some limits to how little queuing we can have. Um, and we also wanted to, to do this thing a to be deployable without having a flat day where you upgrade the whole network. So a lot of the, the benefits we want by just upgrading the access point, for example. And then there's some, some uh, sensibility to reordering for some of the operations, which like, was one of the interesting bugs we had when doing this. That turns out if you add Fanish queuing and then, uh, then pa packets can get reordered and then the se sequence numbers and crypto IVs are out of order and the receiver will drop just drop half of your packets. But especially the, uh, the first two constraints there, that we have to know more about the traffic than a QDIF does, um, and we have to be able to re-inject packets, means that we decided we couldn't use the, uh, the existing QDIF layer without ad adding a lot of API between there that would complicate everything. So um, that's sort of a bit of the background. So what we already did, and what is already in mainline since 
4.11, I think. Four, some of it, like between 4.9 and 4.11, this has gone in, in in like bunches. So we've had reduced buffer bloat by an order of magnitude, uh, as you can see here. Like this is, this is Linux default before 4.9 when this thing went in. Uh, so this is with a, a normal FIFO Q disk, uh, where you get your 500 milliseconds of, of latency under load, and now we're down to around 20. Um, so there's, it's still uh, a bit more than you get on Ethernet, but a lot of that is like the low-hanging fruits have, have been handled now. We also have almost perfect airtime fairness uh, in the driver, which is supported in AF9K. AF10K only has the, uh, the buffer bloat fixes, and we're working on uh, how to expand this to basically all drivers. I'll, I'll get back to that in a bit. So how did we do that? Do this? Well, naturally, once you have a queuing problem and uh, you want to solve this, what we did is we increased the amount of queuing by a factor of about 16. Uh, so like this is uh, we try to, to queue smarter, not harder, um, by changing the algorithm of the queue instead of just getting rid of the queue. And um, what this, what we did in more detail was we created a um, perfo flow queuing structure in the Magator 211 layer, which is the uh, the common library that all the Wi-Fi drivers use to implement the uh, the Mac protocol, which uh, has like a shared pool of queues. So instead of just allocating uh, an FQ toggle instance to every uh, TID that we have to send to, uh, which would take up way too much memory, we sort of created a new structure that uh, is based on FQ total but shares the total number of queues and then just assigns them as they're filled up to, to the different TIDs. So it su supports this per TID dequeuing, you, you have the scheduling everything. And so on top of this, it was quite straightforward to build a, a scheduler where we just measure how much airtime are we using to transmit to each station and then schedule this in a way so that we equal that out over time. Um, it's also a, a deficit round robin based scheduler that does this. It's sort of the idea is also comes from FQ Coddle, but it's working in airtime instead of um, instead of bytes. And then we optimize also for sparse stations. So if you have a station that only transmits one packet every now and then, we will put it at the front of the queue, similar to what FQ Coddle does to uh, sparse flows. And so this is what the, uh, the queuing structure looked like in, uh, in a Wi-Fi device before we started changing things. So this is for the, uh, for the F9K driver, where you have the, uh, the queuedish layer up here with up to 1,000 packets of FIFO queuing by default, uh, or you could replace that with, with anything. But the problem was that down here in the driver below the, the smart queue, you have a whole another layer of queuing with up to 100 and 23 packets, um, and this is what added the latency that we couldn't get rid of. And so what we did was we changed it to this, where uh, down here in the driver, we now only have the retry queue, which contains up to an aggregate of packets if, if transmission failed. That's just priority queue, and then up here in Magator 2.11, we now have the smart queuing system, which um, applies FQ coddle between all these queues and does all the tricks that that does for AQMing and, and prioritizing sparse flows and so on, so we can get the nice low latency. Um, a few evaluation results. We have these, like the FIFO is the default before we started modifying things. Then we tried just putting FQ coddle on the, uh, the Wi-Fi NIC without changing anything. And FQ Mac is then just the new uh, queuing structure, and then the airtime fairness uh, obviously is for airtime fairness scheduling. And latency here, you can see this was the, uh, the green line here was the one I showed you uh, on the slide before, where we're now down to here. So like um, about an order of magnitude uh, less queuing <coughs> to the default, and even compared to uh, putting FQ coddle on, um, on the interface, we get a a benefit of about a factor of two or three in latency. Throughput uh, also increases. So um, 
like this is the test scenario where we have uh, two stations that are really close to the access point, so have excellent throughput, and then one slow station over here. And this is like this is then the total of of all these. So the the slow station gets less and less throughput because we're we're throttling it back, so it doesn't take up all the airtime, and that works out to a really big increase in uh, efficiency for the network. And like the first part here uh, from FQ Cuddle and FQ Mac before we start scheduling airtime is due to more queuing space, so that you cannot this the the slow station cannot take over the whole queue and, and staff the other stations. Um, and this is, as you can see, about a factor of three um, improvement total throughput for the network. Uh, and measuring the, uh, the actual airtime the three stations used, this is where you can see the, uh, the effects of not having airtime fairness, where this station, <laughs> one station takes up between like half and 90% of the total transmission time for the three stations, where when we schedule them, we, we achieve pretty much perfect fairness. So that's sort of what we did already. Um, the next steps that we, we want to try, we have some ideas for further getting rid of the last 20 milliseconds or as much as it as we can of latency. And then there's some, <coughs> some other ideas going forward for how to apply policy to the airtime fairness scheduling, how to handle QoS smarter than what we're doing now, and how to make all this uh, configurable and integrate it with the existing tools. And this is where um, I would like some feedback from you guys. So the first one is sort of um, <coughs> straightforward, I guess. Like we want to minimize the buffering in the hardware as much as we can. So uh, when we don't control the aggregation uh, in the driver, when that is done in firmware or hardware, the only thing we can do is try to minimize the amount of the amount of packets that we send down to the driver. And like there's BQL to do this on Ethernet, and maybe we can adapt that to uh, Wi-Fi as well. There has been some attempts for this, but um, doesn't quite work as well as we would like yet. Um, when we do control aggregate uh, creation in the driver, we can even do better because we can actually start, in theory at least, we can start building the next aggregate once the previous one has started going off, going out. We can. Like it would be really helpful if the hardware can give us an interrupt, not when it's finished transmitting, but when it started transmitting an aggregate, so that we can start building the next one and then get it ready just in time for the next aggregate. Yes. So one thing I'm noticing in, in all of this is that it seems that logically what's, what's happening is that uh, whereas a queuing discipline would measure local queue residency time, you're measuring airtime as your as your queue. We do both. Excuse me. We do both. We do both. Right. So yeah. I'm saying like it's a combination of so you're externalizing the queue, so to speak. Right. It's not just the time that it sits within the local queue and the queuing discipline. It's also the time it sp it spends on the radio. Right. Um. Yeah, so like the latency is mostly the time it spends in the, in right. the queue, but, but we get the other benefits by measuring. Right, so you want time. to transmit interrupts so that you can more accurately measure the airtime component? Mm, no, that we can actually do pretty well already by just, like we get one, we, we, we're a bit behind, like there may be small unfairness on a small time scale because we, we are sort of catching up. Um, the the get the interrupt while we're transmitting is more sort of a a way to try to get fewer bytes queued in the hardware. I see what you're saying. So doing what BQL would have done otherwise. Yes. Okay, I see what you're saying. Um, so like m my idea is that we may be able to do better than just BQL because we know that, okay, we have this one aggregate, it's probably going to take four milliseconds to send out, so we wait like three milliseconds before we build the next one. I see. Um, it's sort of theoretical of how well this would work in practice without the interrupt, then we have to sort of estimate the time. And so it's a more explicit mechanism, whereas BQL is kind of passive. Yes. Like for, for the drivers where we can do this, like at 9K. And so for the other drivers that does aggregation and so on in firmware, we probably can't do better than BQL. Okay. Thank uh. you. And uh, there's also retrans. So, so at, at one point, um, since you mentioned like when we do aggregation in firmware, we do that on the Intel NICs, 
And um, we've played in the past with limiting actually the, the amount of time that, uh, that packets would spend on the queues that get aggregated. So I think we can do better than BQL. Because we, we did do see that when we do this, um, the, the thing is that when, you, when packets spend a lot of time, the reason tends to be that they cannot be aggregated anyway. Mm -hmm. Because if, yeah. you, if you were able to aggregate them, then you would send them out much so much quicker, right? If you send large aggregates, they can take maybe a few milliseconds, maybe one to three milliseconds at most, um, even if they are large. But if, you st if packets start queuing up longer than that, you're really not sending the aggregates. So I think you can do better than BQL because you can measure how, how long your packets are on your queue until they get sent out as aggregates. So th there's some work that the drivers would have to do in that area. But um, yeah, I'm not really sure I, can, I would completely agree with uh, we cannot do better than BQL. OK, cool. I, yeah, if we can get information from the firmware both on transmission time and queuing time before, that, that would be really helpful. Um, the other thing is uh, retransmission. So right now in F9K, uh, every packet will be potentially retried 30 times before it's dropped. Um, and that is a bit on the high end, especially if uh, it's being transmitted at 6 megabits per second. So um, the way to, to fix this, I think, is to start counting how long did we actually try already to send this packet, including how long did we queue it, and then just drop it if we can't get it through and try the next one. Um, and I think that's straightforward to do. I just haven't gotten around to it yet. Then there's uh, the actual size of the aggregate, so that it may be that it would be a good idea uh, if you have 10, 20 stations with, with outstanding packets. You may want to start sending smaller aggregates because if you're spending four milliseconds on each of those 10, 20 stations, that's 50 to 100 milliseconds uh, of delay between each transmission to each station. Whereas if you only send one millisecond aggregate to each, uh, it's only 10, 20 milliseconds at the, thought at, at the cost of a bit of uh, efficiency. So there's a, there's a latency throughput trade-off here somewhere. Um, and and like doing this dynamically and figuring out the right trade-off um, is of course important here. And then for again for firmware, just having a hook into the firmware that says please limit your aggregate size to uh, n milliseconds um, for very small numbers of n would be uh, would be useful here. Yes. Um, moving on to policies. So. Um, whenever you, you present this, especially uh, in academic circles, people start talking about different notions of fairness. And uh, normally, I would argue, because uh, airtime fairness uh, works out to proportional fairness at the throughput level, which is generally what you want, but sometimes not. So for example, if your wireless music player is in the next room at the other end of your apartment from your access point, and it, with airtime fairness, it's now being throttled so that your MP3 streams no longer work. Maybe if you gave it like 1.5 times its fair share of uh, airtime, you would lose a bit of uh, throughput on the whole network, but you could listen to your music stream, that sort of thing. Um, the other thing is someone pointed out to me that when we have this uh, interface, we could also do things like a limited guest network where we don't put in a shaper to throttle it, but we just have a work conserving scheduler that makes sure that if your stations are active on your, um, on your own network, those get priority so that the guest network will never take out more than half of your airtime, which is really the star's resource. So all these kinds of things could, would be nice to be able to do instead of just having the strict fairness scheduler. And my idea for how to do this is to, instead of schedule just individual stations, um, group them. And that way we can also have user space to cite the grouping. Um, and then you schedule airtime first between groups and then within the groups. And you could also, or you could also make the groups like n levels of recursive if you want to get really fancy. And then you can add weights to them. So there's a few examples of, of this. So this is the, I want my slow station to be a bit faster where you just put each station in its own group and weigh the, um, the slow station for however much you want uh, its share to be. Uh, so that gets twice its fair time share in this example. So, so I think there's a 
bit of an issue here, right? Because you, if you weigh the slow station just with twice, and you add more stations to the network, um, then you still go down in airtime, and your music jitter, you know, like has problems again, right? So it yes. seems like you'd want to like group all of the others together in some way. Yeah, that's the next thing. Uh, okay. So yeah. So like th this was actually my example from the guest network, but ma that may be a good point that you could also use this for the other use case. So where you like first you divide out these two groups, they get half the airtime, and then within these groups, these three devices share, and this just gets the other half. So this works really well in this example. If this is your guest network or your slow station, then these will be limited. But what if this is your guest network? Then you're suddenly giving the guest the guest more than its fair share. Um, and like the obvious way to fix this is to have like two sets of groups and then do m max and min on those. And I don't necessarily think that is a good complexity thing to do. Um, so we could also just decide that, oh well, um, that's the limit of the complexity that we want to add to this. And user space can do grouping to try to get around this if they want, but. Um, we don't care. Uh, so, like the grouping policy has good expressiveness. So, my my alternative solution, my thought was, well, we could also just let user space install a BPF program into uh, the scheduler that will allow it to divide up the airtime between all the stations in whatever arbitrary way it wants. The problem is to do this, you kind of need to loop over all the stations that are available. So I'm not sure that's doable, and I'm not sure it's easier. So, um, yeah. Mm. Also, since we're doing more advanced scheduling, we may need to move it out of the fast path and have some kind of internal thing. It doesn't really matter that we are falling a bit behind. Um, like, as I said, on very small timescales, you're going to be unfair pretty much no matter what you do, because we we can't know in advance how long we're going to spend uh, transmitting a packet as we can when we're counting bytes. So so there's no way around that. And like for airtime policy, the whole a prerequisite of doing all of this is right now, um, the airtime scheduler is in the driver in F9K. And uh, I'm trying to change the API between the driver and MAC 11. So instead of the driver just um, get pull deciding which queue to pull from, it will go and ask MacData211 instead and say, please give me the next queue to pull packets from, and then it will start pulling packets from there because that means it's really easy to do the scheduling in MacData211 and the driver doesn't have to change. And there's a, I have a, uh, a draft patch set for that. It probably needs a bit more work, but it's, it seems to work. Yeah, any more comments on airtime policies? Is this is this a good idea? No, may maybe you just answered this here. I, I'm not sure, but uh, I mean in the beginning you mentioned you've got this working on ATH 9K, ATH 10K. Um, I'm wondering, even after this patch goes in, how much of this niceness you've been adding to reduce buffer bloat is, uh, needs to be wired up specifically in each driver? Uh, um, how much of this is really specific to how the hardware works, and how much is this kind of generalized model of sending out airframes? Yeah, so um, the what, what this does is it changes the, uh, the API. I think I maybe forgot to mention this on on this slide with the structure here that as it like before we started changing this this is a push model where MAC 11 when it gets, gets a packet from the network stack it will push it into the driver and the driver will queue it and then send it out later where this API between the driver and MAC 11 in this model is changed to a pull model where the driver just wakes up that or like sorry MAC 11 wakes up the driver and says I have a packet for you and then the driver uh, either on a callback later, or immediately we'll call back up to MAC 11 and say, please give me a, uh, a packet. So, th so the drivers need to be changed to use this API. The problem is there's 35, 30, 35 drivers, uh, so we don't really want to do that <laughs> for all of them, uh, or that, that would take forever. So um, Johannes has, a, has outlined a plan on how to move 
all of Mac 8 to 11 to just use this API and get rid of the whole other one by introducing a compatibility layer so that if the driver doesn't implement the hook um, itself, Mac 8 to 11 will do it for it and have like a shim layer between that will then push the package down. And depending on how much queuing the driver does and how we can limit that, you can get a lot of the uh, benefits that way. But I think like longer term, the drivers will have to change to use this API. Okay, but um, at least it's just a, a change in the API. You don't have to add Coddle to every driver. No, no, that's that lives Good. up here. Okay. Yeah. So we want to to do as much as possible for the driver to to have this in Magneto to eleven. Um, yes. Moving on. Um, QoS handling. What are your default assumptions if airtime is not reported? Uh, For whatever reason, let's say the NIC crashed or you have just too much environmental noise. You mentioned a case where a packet is retransmitted like 30 times before it eventually succeeds or give up, gives up. I actually um, have a slide here. How to get airtime fairness in your driver? Um, and so like the idea is if you don't expose this at the driver level, you will just get round robin scheduling between the active stations and you will get throughput fairness as is the default. But what you have to do is you, this is like the up driver up that you have to implement to, ch to switch to this API. Uh, then we, we have a new hardware flag, which is airtime ac accounting, where you tell uh, MyData211, basically, I know what airtime is and I will report it to you when I can. And then what you have to do is this is the RX and TX status structs that you send up with each packet to MyData211. There's fields in these for airtime where you account wha how much airtime you've used. Um, for the transmit on, on receive, you can, you can calculate how long did this packet take. And, um, and then MACD211 will do its thing. And if these are zero, or if you don't set the flag, it will just fall back. Like we, we want to make sure that we just fall back to doing something sensible where you won't get the benefits, but it won't hurt you either. Yes, um, so QoS. Everyone likes QoS, right? Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So like, at least, so the way Wi-Fi works normally, like the standard specifies four QoS levels, like the voice, video, best effort, and background queues. And uh, those are the diff surf mappings are turned into these queues. Uh, and everyone knows that diff surf is uh, universally deployed and always works, right? So this is fine, um, or not so much. So. Apart from all the issues of how you get your right QoS things, um, actually it is much less needed. I have some more results. I don't know if we'll have time for them. That shows that with these changes, as far as latency is concerned, for example, we can do almost as well with best effort as we could with uh, v the VOQ before, depending on the contention of the air times, of course. But there's also the queuing of uh, the different QoS levels also has some issues, and there's no ad admission control. So for example, you can it's perfectly possible to take a big fat TCP flow, mark the diff surf package to go into the VO queue, and completely throttle everything else going in that queue. Um, there's also the fact that when you have strict priority, you get less aggregation, uh, which can also be an issue. And then there's some interactions with Atom Fanners. I'll go through these quickly now. The first thing, my idea was you can do a kind of soft con admission control where you have your, your VO uh, TID over here and your best effort. And now you have, if you have one of, uh, these are per flow queues, right? So what you can do is you can look at this queue and say, aha, this flow is starting to build a queue uh, on VO, which is not good. It shouldn't be doing that. So what we're going to do is we just pull this whole flow out of this queuing structure and move it over here to BE and remark the packets and send them out as BE. While all the other flows that don't build a queue, they're allowed to go through VO. So this sort of becomes a soft admission control in that it's not a fixed rate that you have to configure as a max rate for VO. It's just if you're sending too many packets and you're building a big queue, we're going to demote you to best effort because then we can aggregate the packets um, and you won't hurt the other well-behaved VO flows. It's sort of a bit like how uh, FQ Coddle will um, prioritize sparse flows, but if you build up a queue, once the round-robin scheduler comes around, you will be, be scheduled as, as best effort. 
Um, and this structure lets us do that with a bit of, of surgery. So um, I haven't tried this yet, but I think that could be a way to get rid of some of the, uh, the QoS problems. So given you have per flow queues and you don't build queues in some of the queues, you don't even need the priority scaling anymore, right? I think it would give you the same result than just not having the priority scaling at all. Sorry? If you would just use FQCordal and not have priority scheduling, this might actually give you the same result. Yes, but um, basically, like, but the thing is, these also affect the uh, MAC airtime contention app av airwave contention parameters. Okay. So if they're sent as VO, you will get a smaller contention window, so you will be more likely to grab the uh, the, uh, the the medium, which is nice. Uh, if it's really contended. So, so it's a way to preserve that, but getting some of the benefits. Uh, the, other th the other idea was, oh, let's see, we have this station that has one VO packet and four BE packets. And what we do now is first we use a tr whole transmit opportunity to send the one, one VO packet without aggregation, and then we, s we do a separate transmission and send the four BE packets. So why just not combine them and send it all off in one aggregate. Uh, you could even do like blog acts to do acting separately and so on, but I'm not, I'm not sure that's needed. And uh, of course the question then becomes at which level should this be sent as VO or as best effort? Um, you can't, in VO is, you can't send it, you can't aggregate on VO, but VI for example, you could, could send it. So um, that's also something that, that might be worth doing. Mm. The next thing is how do we, um, how does QoS interact with airtime fairness? So say you have these two stations with packets outstanding. This one has used up all its airtime deficit, so we shouldn't actually be sending more because then we're not being fair, but it has a VO packet, whereas the one that should be sending according to the airtime scheduler does not. And so right now we have strict priority scheduling, so we sent from VO first, so we actually violate the fairness to get the, um, the QoS parameters. And I'm not sure this is the right thing to do. I think what we should be doing is um, figure out which station to send to from the airtime fairness scheduler, and then take the highest priority packet from that station and send it, uh, subject to the other uh, stuff I was doing with um, QoS. Uh, does anyone not agree with this? Cool. Okay, that's what we're doing. Um, then there's the last issue, which is uh, configurability. So right now, the only uh, interface we have to all this is debugfs, which is obviously uh, not optimal. And I'm going to go downstairs and to the TC workshop and talk about this in a bit as well. But um, we have basically three knobs that we can set the packet and memory limit and the quantum for FQ, and the flags for airtime fairness, uh, which tells the driver whether to account for TX or RX or both. I, this one is, is a debug thing, um, I think. So that's not necessarily settable, but this one corresponds to some of the QDIF knobs. And the same thing with statistics. So an idea, for example, could we, since we have a no queue QDIF, could we have the QDIF statistics reach down into MagData to 11, pull out some statistics and return them to TC? Or should we do something different? Should we come up with a new interface to IW? Should we, uh, some of it is straightforward, like airtime stats we can just add to NL8211. Um, but what's, what's a good way to integrate this with, with tooling that we already have? Microphone? Um, so at, at what arity does the queue, do the queues exist? Is it on a per wireless device basis? Sorry? Do the, 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 the queue instances exist on a per wireless device basis? Yes. Okay. So it kind of seems like some kind of net link interface through NL802.11 to fetch these, <laughs> these, these yeah. things. 
seems to be the way to go, right? Yeah, um, but that means it would be different from any other interface. It's a different interface. See, okay, so th this is this is kind of what you buy into when you pull the the queuing discipline and all this stuff out into the Mac OS Tier 11. You really need your own unique interfaces for this, and there's no reason for the generic queue just layer to know about airtime and things like this. People no, playing with that no. stuff aren't interested, right? Sure. So I, I think a custom set of, uh, I mean, are you guys going to use something other than FQ in the future? So that's the next question. Uh, don't think so, Probably right? I don't think so, but. Like but if that, ev okay, so the answer, yeah. if the answer was yes, that's possible, then yeah, you, we got to think about the interface a little bit more seriously. Yeah. So like, you're right, like airtime stats on, on all this, I think is pretty straightforward that you go into NL8211. My thought was more that some of these things look a little bit like, especially the statistics, look a little bit like what FQ Cuddle is exposing, for example. Right. So could we expose that through the same channels? Is that a good idea? Is that a bad idea? So you, you could share the layout of the message that Codel yeah. uses and encapsulate that in a, in a, in a, a nested attribute that NL8211 can spit back to the user. That's just one idea. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. Just as long as it's not debug FS. <laughs> yes. Yes. We're we're definitely moving it out of debug FS. All right. So in summary, uh, we've reduced Wi-Fi buffer bloat by an order of magnitude already. Uh, yeah. And uh, almost perfect airtime fairness in most cases in the drivers that support it. And we have some ideas going forward. And of course, like there's this is. Uh, when you get the slides, this is a link you can click on to the original paper that um, we wrote describing these things. It's in USENIC's uh, ATC this summer. And many thanks to all the people who have helped test this, give feedback, and the friendly wireless maintainers for taking my patches and so on. So any overarching questions? I'm almost running out of time, actually. That's surprising. So what about testing? How do you test this uh, new packet scheduler? Uh, do you have a fake device to test that? Or because it's, it seems to be, I'm wondering why you didn't um, make it a proper scheduler, packet scheduler, with maybe some few callbacks that the driver could use to fetch a particular packet for a station, whatever. It seems to me that uh, you could have just uh, wrote a new packet scheduler oh. that could be used by a testing curious. device, you know, a uh, fake device to... How, how you make sure that you, you, your change in this packet scheduler are well tested before reaching a, a Wi-Fi driver? Um, yeah, that's, that's a very good question. We don't have any automated testing of on of any of this, what do you mean? But like when you say a packet schedule, do you mean at the QDISH layer or? Yeah, basically uh, being able to use like something like NetEM or you know, uh, uh, um ah, right. something that could be easily tested uh, with some existing infra in the, in the kernel without having a real Wi-Fi test. Yeah, you mean you want to be able to, uh, to assign it to a virtual interface, for example, that sort of thing. Yeah. yeah. So we, we, we haven't hooked this up, but we have the ability to use hardware sim. So we have underneath the Mac 11 stack, we have the hardware sim thing that <coughs> basically uh, pretends to be a bunch of Wi-Fi devices that are talking on a shared medium within the kernel. So that it's entirely virtual. It has, right now, it has no notion of transmission time. So it, it basically, it's instantaneous, right? It's like VF or something. It takes the packet and it's just over here. But um, if we add some sort of notion of transmission time between that and rate control, and we have a way to pull that out into user space to uh, affect the channel parameters and say, all right, this channel is really congested, uh, or this channel is really slow, or you know the, the RSSI between those two stations is really low. So we could have a way of building. We do have a way of building these fake topologies um, already for, for mesh testing and which mesh, mesh, pa mesh path are you taking and things like that. So if we extend that just a little bit to have this notion of how long did it take to transmit this packet, I think we could pretty easily build it um, on top of that. It's not there right now. They're using actual hardware for testing. And that's kind of the first target um, for making sure it works, I guess. Yeah. I could also add on the, like the, the FQ 
queuing stuff is in a library uh, that can, in like FQ imp uh, header that you can use in other places as, as well. So it's fairly generic if you have like, um, I, was, I was talking with, uh, with Jason, for example, and using it for WireGuard, um, but we haven't decided if it's worth the effort yet or if that's the right way to do it. But like, um, any anywhere that you ha want to have um, this thing where you have Vanish queuing, but split up between different entities that need to be scheduled together um, on a on a couple of flows. You can you can reuse this. All right, I'm out of time, right? Yes. Oh, okay. Do you want to see some more slides? <laughs> um, we are, we already did this one, so I have some more uh, application uh, graphs and so on. So this is the uh, HTTP page load time, which like this is. Uh, a log scale, so this is 35 seconds down to uh, one second. Um, for like that's both because of the uh, the better throughput and the the lower latency. But um, maybe more interesting uh, was this thing we did with uh, with VoIP, where we tried out the different QoS levels. So if you send things on the VOQ, the if you send a voice flow on the VOQ uh, before we made all these changes, that gets priority, obviously. Uh, and you can get, I, I'm not going to go into whether or not mass is a good measure, but like four and a half is as far up as it goes. So this is pretty good. One is completely unusable. It's a like synthetic uh, benchmark that came out of the ITU. Um, but down here, once we have the FQ Mac thing, you will notice that the best effort performance is actually better than the VO performance was before we made these changes. So that's the, the thing where QoS becomes less important. Um, and like there's still some things if the network is really contended, but like this means you can actually have usable uh, VoIP on your Wi-Fi network uh, with like apps that can't set its div serve markings or uh, ISPs that remove them and all these kinds of things. Um, the spa station optimization was this thing where we um, prioritize a station that only sends occasionally, and that gives us like uh, another few milliseconds in this test. And then the last thing I want to show you is we also uh, had someone else test this when we were, um, when we were developing it uh, with in a 30 second test bed where the slow station is only running at one megabit per second. So it's artificially limit, limited to like the 802.11b one megabit per se second fire rate. And there you can see, even though there's 30 stations, the slow station takes up two thirds of the available airtime, whereas we can actually limit it even in, in this case with, with 30 stations. And then suddenly the throughput difference goes from like a factor of two or three to a factor of five, six, eight, um, depending on, on which one you compare with. Um, and you can also see that this comes, of course, like the slow station uh, will be throttled, so the latency for that will, of course, be worse. Um, yes, and this is the uh, Johannes uh, outline for the things we need to do to um, to convert Magra to 11, which is a lot of of interesting things. So I don't know that's if anyone is interested, that's there. But otherwise, thank you. <laughs>